Well, good morning. Is this, is this working? Good morning. My name's Phil. Welcome. Uh, I'm one of the, the members at Kingfisher Church. Um, if you haven't been to Kingfisher before, a very, very warm welcome. Um, if you have, you can also have a warm welcome as well. Um, just for those that are not sure, the, um, the, the toilets and everything facility-wise is out the back, just on the right or my right. Um, and uh, when we get to the sermon part of the service, uh, the children will be going out the back with uh, some of the, the members for, the, for their session as well. So if you haven't been before, just follow everyone else if they're going that way, or if you need a toilet, also go that way. Um, so we're here. It's, it's been a very strange week. Um, and uh, uh, I, as I say, I don't know about you, but it seems like we started the week with a, a, a Queen and a Boris Johnson as Prime Minister, and we finished it with a King and Lynn Truss as Prime Minister. So um, a huge week of change, um, a huge week in terms of the monarchy of the UK changing, um, but, but the reason we're here, the reason we're here is to, to worship our eternal king, um, and it's lovely to do that with so many people. It's lovely to, to be a church whose head is so permanent, so true, so faithful. Um, sometimes during that change, we, we, we lose the words. We don't know how to express ourselves, um, but isn't it wonderful that we have a, a glorious, everlasting God, a, a father that we can trust in, a, a faithful creator, a a source that we can turn to no matter whatever life throws at us. Um, and so in order to uh, start proceedings this morning, I thought if we stand, we'll, we'll sing our first song um, in, in response to how awesome our Father God is. So when the musicians start, if you'd like to please stand.
Oh, Heavenly Father, you do indeed see the depths of our heart, and you, you love us the same. We, we praise you this morning. We praise you um, as we stand together um, as, as the, the body of your church, Lord. Please, please forgive us. Please forgive us all the distractions, all the, the things that are unnecessary. But um, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you, that you are sovereign. You are true. You are everlasting. Um, and please be with us this morning as we worship you. Amen. Please take a seat. Um, we're going to do some notices, I believe, now. Uh, it's, it's September, isn't it? So we're kind of getting back into that rhythm. Everyone's gone back to school and various summer holidays have come to an end. Um, and the, the s normal service, is that a sort of way we can use, is beginning to resume at, at Kingfisher. Um, but if, if, you're, if you're new to that or you're familiar, unfamiliar with it, just to go through. So um, Sunday evening, this evening, here at the school at 6 o'clock, we're, we're resuming our evening services. Um, I'm not entirely sure what we're resuming it upon, Rich. Come and see and find out is the challenge to you all. So back here at 6 o'clock for an ex exciting <laughs> mystery service. Um, and then Monday morning, uh, I don't know whether they've resumed last week, but the, the Kingfisher coffee stop back at the, at the hub has started again. So 8.45 till 12 noon, the, um, the coffee stop. If you want to know more about that, uh, uh, Pat's around at the back. She's waving from the door there. Um, Tuesday this week, men's Bible study, 10 o'clock. Uh, hands up if you're hosting that so that anybody would know. Oh, Carmini's house. So Carmini's house. If you don't know where Carmini's house is, you can ask him later. Um, 10 o'clock as well, Kingfisher Women. Is any, any offers for that one? Nikki Fairburn is hosting Kingfisher Women on Tuesday morning. Um, and then there are no home groups this week. Uh, we're having our church family meeting here back at the school at 8 p.m. on Tuesday um, for, for members. Um, Friday, Kingfisher Youth Group. It's not called the Kingfisher. He's, he's nodding his head. It's the Kingfisher Friday night, Friday night thing. Okay, that will be edited in next month's, the next week's, maybe next month probably, next, next week's proceedings. Um, so the Friday night thing is happening at the Bass's house on Friday night, 7 till, 7.30 till 9. My computer's just about to do something amazing. Oh, that's all right. You can't see what my computer's doing. That's fine. That's good. Um, uh, if you don't know where the Bass's is, is uh, there, there's, a, there's a Bass at the front, so do, do ask if you, if you want to know more about the, the Kingfisher Friday night thing. Is it? Just the Friday night thing for chilled youth. Yes, cool. Um, and then next Sunday, uh, you might have noticed on your chairs, there are some postcard type advertorials. Um, we, we're resuming our Tea Time Church, and I believe the lovely Nikki's going to say a few words about that. If I hand over to you.
Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. I, I confess, I have, I've been once, it was really, really good. We did some little activities and everything else. And it is, as Nikki said, it's that, it's that opportunity when you're having conversations with people you know in the street or people that you're friends and neighbours with. Um, if, if you think church is a scary thing for them, if you think that dipping in at a, a different level might be something that's more convenient, just invite them along. There's, there's tea, there's cake. But what more could anyone want, like you said? Um, thanks for that. Um, so in a minute, we're going to sing our next song when the musicians are, are, are ready. You get to stand up again now, Nikki, I'm afraid. Um, but I, I just wanted to sort of share this, this next song that we're going to sing, Where, What Am I God Ordains Is Right. For some reason, it's, I bought an iPhone recently, and it's found all my old songs on iTunes. And I've managed to set it so that at half past six in the morning, this is what wakes me up in the morning. Um, so hence why you got me to lead this day. So I thought I'd choose this as one of the hymns to sing, obviously. Um, but it really is true. I, I just um, would encourage, as, as we sing this, to, to, to really let the word sink into your heart. And um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great way to wake up. There's a bit of life advice for you. If, if, if you've woken up every morning reminded that whatever our God ordains is right, it's is, is, is such an encouragement to me personally to stepping forward into the days, no matter what, what we might experience. Um, we know that our God is everlasting, is true, has, is, is all for our good and for his glory. Um, so when the musicians are ready, if you'd like to stand, we'll sing, and I'll try not to think it's half past six in the morning, I think on <laughs> Sunday.
Thanks ever so much. Please be seated. Um, so it, it has indeed been a strange week, and um, it's great that we can come together as a church to, to pray about all the events of this week for our church, for, for our communities. Um, and so I'm going to invite Dan and Yvonne now to, to come up and lead us in prayers, if I may. This week we're praying for Moldova, and uh, St. Neot's Church for many years has been supporting five different pastors and their churches in Moldova, and we as a church have been supporting them in the time that we have been in existence at Kingfisher. Um, one of the people from uh, Kingfisher Church went out in June and visited them and has you know, come back with uh, information about how they're getting on. So let's pray for them. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that as a church here at Kingfisher, we are able to um, support other people worldwide. And we do thank you for the work that's been going on in Moldova for many years now. We pray for the five different pastors and their churches, that, Lord, you would bless them as they endeavor to serve you in difficult circumstances now with the Ukrainian war. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would help them as they spread the good news of Jesus and the hope beyond this life that there is in Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you would help them as they minister to the needs of the communities that they are serving, that they would be able to be people who shine with the gospel in their towns and villages, and that, Lord, you would be with them as they proclaim the good news of Christ. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the youth groups in the many churches that they have, and we pray that as the youngsters grow up, they would be able to see the truth of the gospel and be that continuing work of uh, your family growing there in that, in that country. And Lord, we do pray for them, especially as a very poor nation. They are trying to um, serve the Ukrainian people as they have fled from the war zones. And Lord, we pray that you would help the churches to be a light and a help in this great time of need. Uh, Lord, we thank you that uh, you are such a great and gracious God to us all. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to remember that the gospel is something that all of us live out daily. And we pray that you would help us as your people here at Kingfisher Church to be doing what uh, you ask us to do, to be a light in this dark world. And so we pray especially for Moldova, Lord, that you would help them at this time. For Jesus' sake, amen. one another as a, as a fellowship that um, we would be tolerant with one another um, so let's come and pray <coughs> Heavenly Father we do come to you and we ask that you'd help us as your people help us to be totally amazed at how you build your church that you call people and they put their trust and faith in you and that uh, you build us as your church locally and worldwide. <coughs> and so we come to you and we ask that you'd help us to have a concern for one another. Um, we know by nature that we're fickle people. Uh, we have likes and dislikes, but we pray that as a church, you would teach us to be loving and caring. We thank you. <coughs> that your word teaches us that you've cast our, all our sins into the, into the depths of the sea. And so help us not to look for the chinks that we have in our own armor and look at others. Please help us to be prayerful and caring. And we pray especially um, for all the events that have happened this week. Uh, we think of the children going back to school and perhaps it's new classes or even new schools but we bring them before you and we ask that you would help us to be aware that all things are in your hand and then we think too of uh, the death of our queen and a new king and not only that that we have a new prime minister <coughs> And we pray that you would help us as a country um, to pray for our Prime Minister. 
we realize that your word teaches us that we should pray for those in authority over us and how we pray that you'd give wisdom in all the decisions they have to make. Uh, we realize too it's very easy to be critical and yet if we were in that position we would be terrified. So we ask for your grace upon our government and help them to make wise decisions and fair decisions. So we bring these matters to you, dear Lord, asking that you would help us, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everyone. Um, so when the, when the musicians are ready, we'll stand and sing our next song. upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes to the hill. Justice and mercy embrace. Then the Son of God gave his life for us, and our measureless debt was erased. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our pride. Our Savior ever true, oh Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes. Thanks. Please be seated. Um, we're we're going to have our Bible reading in a minute, but be before we do so, I just wanted to make you... Are there any more of these left, Rich? 
Oh, OK. Well, I won't mention these then. But if you brought yours along, they're really handy. Um, if, if we can find some spares, we'll, we'll let you know. Um, but we're, we've, we started a, 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 ser a serv sermon series in John's Gospel last week. Um, and uh, yeah, if you don't have a Bible and you want one, stick your hand up. Someone can get you one. Otherwise, I will ask Steve to come up and read for us, if that's all right, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do it now. Okay, yes, Mark. Yeah. I'm just going to interrupt for a moment. Steve does know about this. Steve, um, you moved to Sawtree earlier this year, or was it end of last year? Yeah. First of April, Steve moved to Sawtree, and we, we had met Steve before that, um, and we have really enjoyed getting to know Steve, enjoying fellowship together at Kingfisher Church. Um, now, the Bible tells us that when somebody belongs to the Lord Jesus, when they trust Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, uh, then they belong to Jesus. And then Romans chapter 12, verse 5 says that if you belong to Jesus, you also belong to his people. You belong to the family of his people, and that means we have special responsibilities to care for one another, to love one another, um, to, to follow Christ together. And, and Steve is standing before you as a man who trusts the Lord Jesus, uh, has been trusting him for, for a good number of years. Don't uh, mention that many. <laughs> he belongs to Christ. He is a trophy of grace. Um, and so we have an obligation as a church family to welcome him in the name of Christ, um, for him to join our family formally, um, and for us to love and to care for him as the Bible instructs. So I'm going to pray for Steve as we formally welcome him into membership at Kingfisher Church. Our Father in heaven, we praise you for your great son, our Lord Jesus, uh, the one we have just sung about, the one who came and died for our sins, who was raised again for our justification, who has ascended to glory and one day will return to gather his own. And we praise you that Steve's name is written in that book of life. We praise you that you have saved him, praise you for your mercy poured upon him. Uh, we praise you for... Um, for your many kindnesses to him in his life, and we thank you for bringing him to us, that we might enjoy fellowship with him, uh, enjoy him being part of our family together. We thank you for, for how much we've enjoyed getting to know him so far and for what lies ahead. And Lord, we pray for him. We pray that as he joins us, uh, as we make this relationship formally as part of our family, that, we, that, that he would grow in his knowledge of the Lord Jesus and his love for Christ, and that we would grow with him, and that we might encourage him, and he might encourage us, and we would love each other just as our Savior has loved us. So we thank you. Thank you for Steve. We thank you for him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome. You're going to read for us, aren't you? So the reading this morning is, is from John. Uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. Uh, I believe if you're using a church bar Bible, you'll find it on page 1063. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him... Nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born, not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only 
who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to sing our third song now. Um, when uh, the musicians are ready, if you'd like to stand. During this song, there is a, a notice comes up, so at that point, if the, the leaders and the children would like to take the children through to their groups. Um, that would be grand. Um, so, yep, when the musicians are ready, please stand. Ooh, okay. much. Please be seated. Um, Rich, our pastor, is now going to come and preach for us. Thanks, Rob. Good morning. 
Uh, we are going to look at the passage that was read for us. It'd be helpful if you have it open in front of you. Um, there's still our Bibles at the back that you can go and grab. But I'm going to pray and ask that God will help us to understand what he says in his word. Our Lord Almighty, we, we, we sang um, a, a song ago, we want to turn our eyes upon the Lord Jesus. And uh, Father, that's our request as we, as we look at the of Scripture now. We pray that you, by your Spirit, would turn our eyes to Jesus. Amen. Uh, Phil spoke about how he starts his morning. Um, I wonder if you made your bed this morning. Want to put your hands up if you made your bed? Kind of 20% maybe. Um, Not bad, isn't it? Do you know that it is National Make Your Bed Day? It's not here, so you're okay. Um, National Make Your Bed Day. Apparently, if if the first thing you do in the morning is to make your bed, it is the key to being happy. Do you know that? It's very simple. And if you want to be happy, and who doesn't want to be happy, what you need to do, first thing in the morning... Make your bed. That is the advice of some unqualified and random blogger that I saw, so it must be, must be true. In fact, though, I did some research, and there is a book that has been published on the value of making your bed first thing in the morning and the happiness it brings. So it must be the way ahead. Might be something in that. Um, but how we start our day is important, isn't it? I don't know how, how many of you, how, how soon it is in your day that you start to listen to yourself. Um, I don't know if you have days like this. I have days like this when when, when sometimes I wake up early and immediately my mind starts to spiral down. My first waking thoughts are, what a fool I am. And before the sun has even risen, I'm plagued by memories of what I lack. Uh, Things that I've done wrong, things I've failed to do, or, or just the kind of looming pressure of the coming day and a wilting sense of inadequacy. If you have days like that. The question is, what is the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day? Uh, Can I find something better than making my bed as the first priority? What does the Bible say? Uh, We began last week to look at John's gospel, John's account of Jesus' life. uh, And he begins with these 18 verses. We we had a a bite at them last week. We're having another go at them again this week. Um, These 18 verses that John begins with, uh, they are loaded with mind-boggling reality. Uh, Just a few verses, but they speak of fathomless depths. Uh, In many ways, what John does is he writes about Jesus. He, He writes these 18 verses, and then he spends 21 chapters explaining them. Um, now, if, so if we find ourselves struggling in these first 18 verses, that's okay, because we're going to have 21 more chapters to help us understand what is going on here. Now, we, we started to look last time, we, we saw that in these verses, what John is, is doing, he's, he's telling about the coming of God, who he calls the Word, the coming of God to bring indestructible life. And, and he looks at that great subject from three different angles. Uh, in verses 1 to 5, he tells how the Word comes and light wins. Uh, And then in verses 6 to 13, he tells how the word comes and life is birthed. And then verses 14 to 18, the word comes, which means love is here. Uh, Last week, we got to the end of verse 13, so we'll start at the beginning of verse 14 this week, and picking up this third picture. The word comes, the coming of God to bring indestructible life. The word comes, and that means love is here. So, how does he begin? Look at the start of verse 14. The word became flesh. The word became flesh flesh. And one of the things I love about swimming in the sea is, um, is that as you swim in the sea, you can look out and just as far as you can see, right up to the horizon, right up to where the kind of curvature of the earth takes away your view, it's all just sea, isn't it? It's huge. It's so vast. Um, as you swim in the sea, that there are kind of, you know there are wonders and there are depths out there, and you're just in the shallows, but you are in it, aren't you? You are in this great, vast thing that seems to be without end. The Word became flesh. Just a few words. A few words which tell of something which is beyond telling. This 
this is a truth that dazzles the angels. And, and there is a comfort in these verses. There is a great, great comfort. Uh, John is starting this third picture like he began his first. Verse 1 and verse 14, the only two verses that call this person the Word. Now just glance with me back to verse 1 so we know who it is we're talking about. John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word who has no beginning, the Word who always is and is in closest relationship with God, who is with God and also is God. This one, as verse 3 says, he is the author of existence. He's the great cause of all the uncaused things. This is the, this is the indescribable infinity. This is the, the eternal, the immortal, the unchanging, the, the perfect sublime majesty, the great immensity, the adoration of all the heavens. Now John is, it labors to say, that I don't want you to have any doubt that when I talk about the word, I am talking about God. And he begins, he, this is how he begins. He says, this word came, came to give light. And that's what we saw last time. But verse 14 shows us how the word comes. What kind of coming is this? The word became flesh. This is really blunt, really, really blunt. Flesh is, it, that's our, our manufactured humanity. It's what we are as people. It's, it's, our, it's, it's, it's what we are in our ruin. It's, it's what we are in, in, in the mess of our fallenness. John is, is saying that this word, the, the immortal, the, the eternal, the unchanging, the infinite God became flesh, like we are, mortal, finite, temporal. Now, God, God cannot change. The word is God, so must always be God. The word can never stop being God. So he doesn't swap his godness to become flesh. Do we get that? That would be nonsense. If we know who God is, God cannot swap anything out of himself. He can't change. He can't stop being what he is. He didn't swap his godness. He doesn't pretend to be flesh. It's not an illusion. John's using the same word he used in verse 3 to speak about the creation of things. The word is made to be, is brought into existence as flesh. And John wants us to be so clear on these two points as he sets out this story of what Jesus was like on earth. He wants us to be so clear that this word is God and this word is flesh. Never stopping being God, but then at a point of time, becoming what he had not been. And so from that point forward, continuing this one person with two natures. He is God and he is man. How do we wrestle with that? How do, how do we wrestle with it? Now imagine with me, some of you might find this easy, imagine a, a moldy pile of clothes. Um, now, now really bad actually, like, like a, a pile of clothes that is it's beginning to decay, it's beginning to rot, you can see maggots climbing out of it. Imagine that pile of clothes. Some of you saw that in your bedroom this morning maybe. Um, imagine that pile of clothes. Imagine taking it, wrapping it up, and giving it to a friend as a present. How, how do you think that friendship would last after that? It, it wouldn't go very well, would it? Uh, this week, um, inevitably, the news has been filled with people's reflections on the Queen. And I, I was listening to a head of state from Af one of the African countries, I think, who, who spoke about um, the moment before he was going to meet the Queen for the first time and how nervous he was. Now, he, he was a head of state himself, but he was meeting the Queen of England. He, he was terrified about it. Imagine what it would have been to have offered that bundle of filthy clothes. Now, what's happening in verse 14? What's happening is the word is he, he's debasing himself. This is infinitely more humbling than the Queen dressing in stinky rags. Now, God is... God's most defining quality is that he is not like us. And it's one of the reasons we find it so hard to understand God is that whenever we try to imagine him, we, we imagine him like stuff that he's made. 
Uh, we describe him as a kind of extension of the, the, the creation. But, but God is, is not like that. He's not comparable to anything else. Uh, God is, is, is unique. So unique. He's so more than, than, than anything we can understand. In fact, if we were to take every thought that had ever been thought about God by every person who had ever lived and we put them all together, we would barely touch the outer edges of what he is like. Psalm 113 says this. It says, the Lord is exalted over all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? The one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. And God is so far. He's so beyond. He's so above. that for Even for him to look, he has to stoop. To look into the created realm, the entire universe, he has to bend himself down. It's like if we were to try and follow the the movement of an ant into a crack in the floor. We'd have to get on our knees to see that low. God has to stoop. But here in John 1, 14, he doesn't just look. He comes. He comes by becoming. He doesn't just put on humanity like a set of clothes. He becomes flesh. This is a humongous humbling. Entering fully into the defiled condition of creaturely weakness. He doesn't stand back. That's what John's trying to show us. He doesn't just look. He comes. He rushes in all of the way. Why does he do that? A few years ago, Nikki and I went to one of her relations for dinner. Um, The first time I'd met a number of these people and... um, uh, I was sitting at this table talking to the host, this, this guy, and um, I remember him. He, he told me this really long tale about the wine that he was offering me to drink. Uh, a long tale about how this wasn't just any old bottle of wine. It was a very special bottle of wine, and he'd been researching this wine, and he'd learned, I guess through his contacts in the world of wine, that this wine was getting a, a shipment into the country. And he'd driven for hours in order to get this wine and to bring it to the table and to serve it to me. Um, and I've got to tell you, you know, it did taste like wine, um, but um, I, I, I wouldn't travel very far for a bottle of wine, I don't think. But this chap, he, it, it, was, it was a joy for him to have gone that far to get something that was so precious. What about this word? This word doesn't travel for a few hours. He doesn't travel across a country. He doesn't even travel across the globe. He doesn't even travel across the universe. This word, he, he crosses a, a, a distance that is It is infinite. It's it's, it's uncrossable. There are only there there are only two types of things that exist. That there are things that are made, and there is a maker, created things, and creator, and 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 that those things they don't meet. They don't. They can't cross over. One can't jump from one category to the other. It's, It's an uncrossable divide. But this word, he does what defies understanding. He, he does what anybody with any sense of the majesty of God must be baffled to read. The word became flesh. Why would he do it? Let's, um, let's play the, the children's game, which we adults love so much. And let's keep asking why. Why, why, why? Let's let's follow the journey through, shall we? The word became flesh. Why? What's the next thing that John says? And made his dwelling among us. Or or the the sense is that he he pitched his tent here. John wants to draw on the history of God's people. The the moment in in the history of God's people when he brought them out from slavery. He, He met them at a burning mountain. And on that mountain gave them instructions to build a tent. And the specific instructions and ceremonies and special things with this tent. Because the tent represented that God wanted to live among his people. And the tent became the temple. Which was built at the center of the nation. Because God wanted to live among his people. And now John says that what was then in shadow is brought to realization. Full realization. Because God really lives among us. The word became flesh. That God is coming so close. He's coming so near. The reason the word became flesh is so he can live among us. Why? We ask again, why? Well, what's the next thing that John says? 
we have seen his glory. You see, we, we, we track through verse 14. Do, do you follow? John says the word flesh. Why? So he can live among us. Why? We have seen his glory. He's come to show something. What is glory? I find it helpful to think about the sun in the sky. Um, the beams of light that radiate from the sun, that's its glory, the shining out of its brilliance. In, in the Old Testament, the word for glory is the word for weightiness. And, and again, I think the sun is helpful when we think about that because the sun has such a size, has such a mass that all the planets in the solar system are attracted to it. The, ho- the orbit of the planets is defined by the, the sun because it has such a great size. And glory is that weightiness, that great significance. John says the word became flesh and in this God-man we have seen glory. But what is it? What's the shining brilliance that they saw? What is that weighty significance that they saw? He looked like a man. Sorry chaps, that's not that glorious. Um, In fact, the Bible tells us he wasn't much to look at. It wasn't impressive to see. So what did they see when they saw him? Well, John explains, doesn't he? Do you see what he says next? It is the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. That word, one and only Son, is is a translation of a word which means the only one of its kind. And so it's used to describe something that is highly treasured, a unique, precious thing. It's the only thing, and so it is dearly, dearly loved. There is a uniqueness to the word. Nothing else like the word, and the uniqueness that John focuses on is that he came, comes from the Father. If you glance to verse 18, you see that John picks up on this again. Again, he speaks of the one and only son, this one-of-a-kind treasure. In fact, verse 18 rounds off. It it, it repeats what verse 1 says. Verse 1 says, the word was God. Verse 18 tells us again, who is himself God. Verse 1 says, the word is with God. And verse 18 says again, he is the one who is in closest relationship with the Father. God is Father. Now, I wasn't a father until I had a child. Yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? You don't become a father until there's a child who exists. But here we have the unchanging God and he is father. See, from all eternity, for God to be father, there must from all eternity have been the son. This word, this unique, one-of-a-kind treasure who is in the closest relationship with the father. This is God's son. The son is with God. The son is God. The one God is Father and Son, the the two persons who share that divine nature. And and I don't know if you're keeping up with me, but at this point, our our brains are just beginning to melt, aren't they? It breaks our brains to try and think about these things. But the reason that it matters in verse 18 is that John says nobody's ever seen God. we've, We've never seen God, but he says, when God, who is the Son, became flesh and lived among us, he makes God known. This God-man, this Jesus Christ, he, 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 he speaks God to us in a language we can understand. You can't know God apart from through Jesus. And we'll see that as we go through John's gospel. We'll see that anybody who claims to know God without Jesus doesn't know God. But, but this is the thing that John wants us to get in this, this starting bit. That, this, that the particular making known of God in the coming of the Son... The thing that comes into focus is that the eternal God, he is Father and he is Son. And the Son is in the closest relationship with the Father. Literally, it says he's in the bosom of the Father. That that means this Son is laid across the heart of the Father. The Son has always been this unchanging, wonderful object of the Father's delight, his love. And that's what we see when we look at Jesus. When we look at Jesus, we see in a way that we can't see anywhere else that God has always been love. That there was never a time when God couldn't love because there was nothing else to love. Because there, because there has always been God. And God is Father, and God is Son, 
And they have always been in this infinite loving communion. And so John says in verse 14, we've seen his glory. We've seen the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. He's saying we have seen that God is love. That Jesus, the Son in the flesh, that's what he's making known. Before we get out of verse 14, there's one more thing John wants us to see. One more thing about the glory. He says, we've seen the glory. What is the glory? It's the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. And then he adds, full of grace and truth. Uh, Come with me to a mountain. Imagine on a, a, a craggy, rocky mountain. You stand on the top of this mountain and you look out into the valley below. A, a great plain. And th- this plain is a, a scene of devastation. It's, it's filled with people. There are, there are tents pitched everywhere. Um, but, but there's this, this atmosphere over this plain, over, the, over all these people of great grief. There's a sadness, there's regret everywhere. It's the people who have messed up big time. They, they were slaves once. A God came and he rescued them and very quickly they got muddled and they, they built this idol for them to worship. They claimed that this golden calf they had produced was the God who had rescued them from Egypt. And, and they worshipped the idol and they worshipped the idol in, in pretty obscene ways. Moses, who was their leader, he came and he found them, as it were, with their pants down. And and like us, when we do stuff wrong, they made pathetic excuses, but their guilt was written everywhere. And Moses goes back up the mountain, and he speaks to God about them. And he says to God, I can't do it. I can't lead this people. He pleads with God. He says, God, you've got to show me your glory. God God says, you can't see me and live. But I, I will hide you. I will cover you. I will let the back of my glory pass by. And as that happened, God spoke his name, and he said, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. After terrible sin, the Lord shows his grace. John says here in verse 17, the law was given through Moses. That revelation of God's glory to Moses, the glory of his mercy and his gracious faithfulness that happened as the giving, at the giving of the law. But now John's saying, what was then in part is now brought to completion. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. What was just glimmered in the Old Testament, what Moses saw, it burst into midday brightness when the word became flesh. At the glory that they saw was that when Jesus makes known that God is love, they see him to be full of grace and truth. They seem to be what God has always been, abounding in love and faithfulness. These, these are bold claims, aren't they? No, they're really bold claims. John's saying this, that this man, Jesus Christ, this man of history, he is fully God, he's fully man, and he's, and he's doing all of these things. And you think, it's, it's a bit much, isn't it? Isn't it? Now, how, how can we know? Uh, what John's writing is real. Well, well, Christianity is, it's not about ideas. It's about what happened. When, When John says the word became flesh, he's not giving us a philosophy. He's giving a record of an event in history. And, and Christianity will stand or fall on whether or not these things actually happened. So how can we know? Well, in verse 15, John gives an aside. You see, it's put in brackets. I think that's appropriate. He's mentioned already the witness of John. We'll see it again. This is not John the writer. This is John the baptizer. And again, in verse 15, John says, This other John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. This this John is going to point to Jesus and say, he comes after me. He was born in the flesh after me, but also he was before me. He's going to say, this this Jesus, the one who became flesh, existed beforehand. He's going to give testimony to that. 
But, but I think this aside in verse 15 is directing us who read, as we begin to read, to say you need to go and listen to the witnesses who saw Jesus on earth. You, you have to look at those who, who saw what he did. Listen to what they say. Now that, that's the challenge that comes to us. Uh, John's saying we've seen his glory. And that claim has to be examined by what we see in the life of Jesus. We're to listen to the witnesses. That's what John's gospel is written for us, an eyewitness account of what Jesus did and said, so we can examine and see whether the claims stand up. And as we do that, we have to be so careful that we don't kind of cage in our understanding by the limit of what we think is possible. You know, if, we, if we read the accounts of Jesus and think, well, that or that cannot be, we're, we're prejudging the outcome. As we read through John's gospel, the question is not, do you think it's possible? The question is, what does the evidence of the witnesses show? John's claim is the word became flesh, and he with the other witnesses saw the glory. He saw in the life of Jesus that he is the son of God who makes known that God is love. And we're to examine that as we read through the gospel. But let's just push the why question one more time. Why? Look at verse 16. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. Why does the word become flesh? He, he comes to show his glory. But what's the outcome of that? Why does he do that? Verse 16. We have all received. The outcome of it is that every one of us can get in on this. What we can get in on is this. Grace in place of grace already given. Grace upon grace. Grace that, that comes out of his fullness. See, this word who is God, who is full beyond measure, out of that fullness we can get grace. And Jesus Christ makes known that God is love so that we can get grace. Grace, that's what happened when God revealed his glory to Moses. There are people who were blatant sinners and deserved to be denied any goodness. There are people who were then included in God's loving care. That, that's what grace is. Grace is when, when God's love reaches someone who doesn't have any reason to be loved. That's grace, isn't it? John says we received grace. We received grace when Jesus showed us that God is love. See, when Jesus showed us God is love, he didn't say, you can have a look, but you can't touch. He said, you can get in on this. The eternal, unlimited sharing of love between God the Father and God the Son. The laying of the Son over the Father's heart. Jesus came so we can receive that kind of love. And we can have it when there is nothing in us that is anywhere near that lovely. We can receive grace. We can get in on what we have no right to have. Now, that's what John said in verse 12, isn't it? We saw it last week. See verse 12? It says he gives the right to become children of God. That's what grace is. Grace is to get given a right to what we have no right to. It means we can all receive. See, grace does not say you can't come if. Grace never says that. Grace says you can come, you can get in on this, whatever or whoever. If you're a, a hardened atheist and you spent all your life denying that God even exists, Grace says, I'm not going to hold that against you. You can get in on this. Or, or if you're a, a failure, like all of us, Grace says, no worries. You, you can receive love because it's not about what you deserve. It's all about God's willingness to give. And he wants to give. That's why he came. We can get out of his fullness grace upon grace. It, it's saying that there is no limit to the supply of grace that we can get. It's, it's an inexhaustible supply. And an inexhaustible supply means that we cannot exhaust it. We can't run out of grace. There's always going to be more. So, so when we, we fall flat and we've messed up for the millionth time and we can't bear to even look our own selves in the face, there's more grace. When we've worked our fingers to the bone, We've got nothing left in ourselves. There's more grace. You can't run out of grace. 
And, and, and the reason that we can't run out of grace, it's important that, that we see the reason why we can't run out of it. We just compare for a moment verse 12 and 16. We looked last time at verse 12, which says, to, to believe in Jesus, to put our faith in Jesus, means that we receive him. Now, that those who receive him, that is those who believe in his name. To, to believe is to receive. Now, that's why John writes his gospel. He, he, he writes his gospel. He, he explains at the end in John 20, 31, he says, these, th these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John says to those who read his gospel, I want you to get Jesus. That, that's what I want for you. In, in the, the, the muddled, messed up state of the world and of your own lives, what I want for you is I want you to get Jesus. I want you to get Jesus because that's the only way to have life and to be held in the everlasting love of God. Verse 12 says, when we believe, we receive Jesus. And verse 16 then speaks about receiving again, but it says we all can receive grace. John is saying the same thing. See, we have to be clear on this, that what gets offered in the Christian gospel, that the, the, the main thing that's offered in the Christian gospel is not, is, is not things. The, the, the Christian message doesn't say uh, you, you can get these things, even if they're good things. The, the message mostly is not you can have forgiveness or you can get peace or you can have eternal life. It's all of those things, but the message is not you can get the things. The message is you can have Jesus Christ. You can have him. You can receive him and in whom you will find everything else. Grace isn't something that Jesus gives. He hasn't got a little package of grace that he kind of, he kind of dispenses out like a sower sowing seed. He doesn't do that. He doesn't break off a little bit and, and, and sprinkle it to you. That's not what grace is. Grace isn't a thing. Grace is Jesus. And, and he gives you himself. That's why grace doesn't run out. There's, there's no limit to him. That's why it doesn't run out. That's why out of his fullness we receive because we receive him. Now the glory of the word is that he is the one and only son, very God in the bosom of the father, who comes into our flesh so that we can know that God is love and we can share that love when we receive him. So let's think again about how we start our days, how we wake up in the morning. You, you can make your bed first of all if you like. That's fine. You might get happy that way. Uh, there might be something better, though. Uh, George Muller, who opened a number of orphanages, he's, he's well known for that in the 19th century. He, he, he said that he, he learned this, this, this lesson, this rule. He, he said this. He said, the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day is to have my soul happy in the Lord. That's his first thing, his first priority. Well, what's he going to do as he wakes up? His first thing he's going to give his attention to is to get his soul happy in the Lord. Sounds better than making your bed, doesn't it? But how do we do it? How, how do we start a day with the kind of confidence, the confidence where we can kind of look in the mirror and we can say, I am loved. I am astonishingly and wonderfully and forever loved. How do we command those dark thoughts and the doubts to flee away and declare as the day dawns, say this day I am not alone and I am not abandoned and I never will be. How do we, we kind of wake up with a sense of my feelings are not my reality? The dark clouds may press upon my soul, but my feelings are not my truth. That's liberating, isn't it? How do we do it? Uh, George Muller says you need to read the Bible. That's, that's basically his advice. And, and what we see in John 1 brings those truths to blossom. Look at what the Son of God did. The Word became past infinity, did what was unthinkable, lowered himself to unimaginable depths, came right into the heart of deepest darkness, and he came all of the way, and do you know why he did it? He did it for you. He did it so that you can receive his We could refuse that, of course. We're free to refuse. But why would you refuse that? 
And when we believe on Jesus, we receive him. Now that heart, which, which may be yours, that fears it could never be known and loved, that soul that is plagued with guilt, look at this. That the word became flesh and showed the glory of his grace and truth, showed you a glory that would include you in the love of God. So that we can say each day as we start, my feelings are not my reality. I'm not forever stained. My future is not written by my past. But God in Christ came for me. And he loves me. And I have him. Let's just take a moment of quiet. Oh God in heaven, I pray that you would help us to see and to know more of the greatness of what you have done for us in the gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, please would you help us to know that since you have given him and that he has come so far for us, Lord, there's nothing else that you would hold back from us. Help us to be content and happy in that great grace. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing together as the musicians come back. We might not have the words. Okay. Okay. Have you got the words on there? Okay. Musicians are getting ready. Since we haven't got any words, we are going to sing. We're going to sing. Um, what are we going to sing? Yet yeah, not I, but through Christ in me. Um, if you have a phone, just Google it and it'll give you the words. Um, if you don't know the words, um, just enjoy listening to other people singing.
Uh, we're going to be meeting back here at 6 o'clock. It'd be lovely to see you then. Uh, but now, now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.